Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanchman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. Suppose we have a signal going into a system with the impulse response H of T. By me saying that it has an impulse response H of T, I'm already implying that it's a linear time invariant system, but I should explicitly state it. And we get some output Y of T. In general, this is a fairly tricky thing. We know that we can get the output by convolving the input with the impulse response, but as we've seen, this can be a fairly difficult operation. If we know that our signal here is periodic with a period t naught, then we can use some of the ideas about Fourier series reviewed in the last lecture to figure out what the output is. And this will be the main topic of this, the 14th lecture in the Summer 2020 offering of EC3084, Signals and Systems. You might want to review Lecture 9, which was titled, Why LTI Systems Are Awesome. In addition to talking about the impulse response, where we take an impulse, put it into the system, and we get the impulse response back, we talked about the idea of a frequency response. We could compute the frequency response of a system, by integrating the impulse response against e to the minus j omega t dt. Not coincidentally, this looks like a Fourier transform, which we'll discuss in more detail in the next lecture. And the idea behind this frequency response from Lecture 9 is that it tells you what you get out of a system with this frequency response. Remember, this is a equivalent representation to the impulse response if the system is linear and time invariant. And the idea is that if we put in a complex sinusoid with frequency e to the j omega naught t, and what I get out is a complex sinusoid of the same frequency, but the amplitude and the phase may be changed by the frequency response, which in general is complex valued, evaluated at omega naught, the frequency going in. For the purpose of this lecture, I would like to make a distinction between the omega naught I'm using here that represents some generic frequency and the omega naught I'm going to use later, which represents the fundamental frequency of a periodic signal. So this suggests a possibility for how to handle periodic signals. We know that we can write periodic signals using a Fourier series sum with Fourier series coefficients a, k, then we have e to the j k omega naught t. And now you see why I wanted to use a tilde here, because this omega naught with the tilde sort of represents a generic frequency, but the frequencies here are integer multiples indicated by k of some fundamental frequency omega naught. So we know how the system would respond to any individual complex sinusoid. The input is a weighted sum of complex sinusoids. By linearity, we can take each of the individual sinusoids, imagine putting them through one at a time and then adding up the results on the other side. Similarly, for each of the sinusoids, the AK is just a constant that pulls out in front for each of the sinusoids. So if we take that and put that into a system with the frequency response big H of J omega, what we get out is going to be a sum of sinusoids E to the J K omega naught T going from minus infinity to infinity, and the only real difference is each of these AKs is going to be multiplied by the frequency response evaluated at K omega naught. So if I look at this here, well, this is another Fourier series. What are these? These are basically a set of new Fourier series coefficients for a new Fourier series. So the frequencies don't change. Some of the frequency components might get eliminated if big H was zero, and some might have their amplitudes and their phases change depending on the magnitude and angle of this complex number big H. All right, so let's do an example. We need a function to go in. Let's use the square wave that we computed the Fourier series coefficients for last time. The particular square wave we computed those coefficients for went from zero to one, and was centered at zero. So the Fourier series coefficients for this were one half for the special case of k equals zero and sine k pi over two divided by pi k for all of the other k. So a consequence of this formula is that all of the even harmonics are missing except of course for the DC value of k equals zero. All right, so that's our signal that's going in to the system. We need a system. 
To make our lives easy, I'm going to pick a frequency response of an ideal low-pass filter. So it's going to be 1 up until a certain point. I'm going to call this omega C. And we'll have it go from minus omega C to omega C. And this is our big H of J omega. In future lectures, we'll use Fourier transform theory to analyze this, take its inverse Fourier transform to find out what the corresponding impulse response H of T is, and demonstrate why you can't actually build this perfect low-pass filter in real life. So why are we talking about this even if you can't ever build it? Well, you could build things close-ish to it, and using an approximation like this will make some analysis easy and get you in the ballpark of understanding what's going on with a real system. Let's go ahead and plot these coefficients. We'll have this one omega naught, two omega naught. So here I'm plotting on the omega axis, and so everything is a multiple of omega naught here. I think in the last lecture, I might have just plotted against k. Okay, that's not exactly a work of art. Anyway, what did this look like? We had a value of 1 half at 0. The value for a 1 was 1 over pi, which is around a third. And then everything here was symmetric. We have a negative going one here. I'm only drawing these arrows going downward because it happens to be the case that these AK are real valued, so it makes sense to have things going up and down. If you do have AK that are complex valued, it can get more problematic to plot. And it's usually best to just plot the magnitudes with all the arrows going upward, and then write in phases when needed. A bit of a spoiler alert warning is that later when we talk about Fourier transform theory, we'll make plots like this, but they will all have a 2 pi multiplying everything. And we'll talk about why that shows up. All right, so what are we going to get for different values? Well, it depends on what omega c is. If we tried omega c equal omega naught over 2, for instance, so in this case, our filter our function would look something like this. It has a height of 1. I'm not really drawing this to scale, but I just want to figure out what's in here. Well, this is just going to have the DC value. So the output in this particular case, if we're just including that DC coefficient, let me call this y naught, just to have something to call it. It's just going to equal 1 half. It's going to equal the a naught that's sitting here. All right, so now let's try omega c is equal to to omega naught. In this case, we have the filter covering this zone. Notice that my life becomes a little less complicated because A2 is zero. I'll try to never give you a problem where there's this transition point of the filter exactly on one of these spectral line coefficients like this, since at that point we're mathematically on very shaky ground. But in this case, it's zero, so it's okay. Let's write the answer here as Y1 of T y1 of t, and what do we have here? We have the dc value, which if I had left on its own would give us just this straight line here. But notice I have a couple of coefficients here. I'm gonna have a1 here, which is gonna be one over pi, times in the Fourier series, e to the j omega naught t. So there's a k equal one that's hiding in here. And then I also have the a minus 1 coefficient here, and that's going to give me a 1 over pi e to the minus j omega naught t. And now I can use Euler's formula to write this as 1 half plus 2 over pi cosine omega naught t. Okay, so 2 over pi is around 0.6. What we would have here, if we add this cosine to the dc value, we've got a sinusoid that's going to cross at this half point, and it's going to go a little bit above and a little bit below the plateaus of the square wave. So not the greatest approximation to a square wave, partly because we only have one coefficient there, and partly because I'm a terrible artist. All right, so now let's try to include the third harmonic. So let's suppose the cutoff is now 4 omega naught, so that will put it here. I'm going to erase this here to avoid confusion. This is now of height 1. And so we're now also including this minus 1 over 3 pi for a 3. So let's see what happens when we add that in. To have room to write this additional term, I'll need to move this down a bit. So now let's call this y3 because we're going to include the a3 coefficient. So what are we adding in here? We'll have minus 1 over 3 pi e to the j 
3 omega naught t, and then we'll have minus 1 over 3 pi e to the minus j3 omega naught t. So there will be a couple of ways to write this. Because we only have pluses and minuses here, we don't have any strange phases on any of these terms. You might just go ahead and write this with a minus using Euler's formula as 2 over 3 pi cosine 3 omega naught t. Or, usually if you have a bunch of different strange phases going on here, you might want to try to unify everything by writing everything using a positive coefficient in front of the cosine. So I'd write 2 over 3 pi cosine 3 omega naught t plus pi to incorporate that minus. So your mileage may vary. This is going to look something like this. It will still overall have a sinusoid shape, but you'll get these little horns here that are trying to start to get a better fit to the square wave. If you have a continuous periodic function, then your Fourier series is going to converge at every point. If you have a discontinuity like we do in this case, you wind up with a strange effect for something like the square wave where the wiggles sort of get smaller in this flat part here and you get more wiggles, but you get the overshoots at these discontinuities. These overshoots never go away, although they do get thinner and thinner. When we write down the formula for the Fourier series of x of t is equal to sum k going from minus infinity to infinity dot dot dot, I just want to let you know that this equal sign is a little bit suspect when there's a discontinuity. We'll talk about convergence where the error, where the mean square error of the function goes to zero, which is an average error that will go to zero, but it doesn't necessarily go to zero point-wise the way it would for a continuous function. This is a mathematical detail that's a little more detailed than what we need in this class, but it's a good thing to know.